Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun. The mass of Jupiter is twice that of all other planets in the solar system combined. I'm Larry Ross, director of space programs at NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Now I'm your host for this ninth program of the 13 part series called Journey Through the Solar System. During this program, you'll see the NASA film titled Jupiter Odyssey. It's about the Pioneer 10 spacecraft launched by the Lewis-managed Atlas Centaur. The probe had the nearest approach to the planet on December 3, 1973. Today, we have a clearer picture of Jupiter and its moons than is presented in the upcoming film. The reason? The more advanced Voyager spacecraft later flew by the planet. We will look at the Voyager project in another program and learn newer details, such as the current count of 14 moons. This program's older film reports that there are 12 moons. Now let's see that movie, which shows our first good look at Jupiter in 1973. They used to be called heavenly bodies. Our local star, prime mover of the earthly environment, father of all life. Our almost twin satellite, phasing predictably through the night. Small wonder both were regarded as gods by the ancients. Today we know the moon as a place. Now picture, if you will, a fantastic world where not one but 12 moons crisscross the sky, four of them moving backwards, four others the size of small planets. This is Jupiter, largest member by far of the Sun's family, monarch of the outer planets, a thousand times the size of Earth. In fact, twice as large as all the other planets combined. It is nearly a small star, a second sun, Jupiter, named for the Roman god of gods. To our eyes, it reveals only its dazzling cloud tops, rivers of wild color, and its trademark, the great red spot, a perpetual storm of unknown origin. On Jupiter, day and night are each less than five Earth hours long, and a man would weigh 500 pounds. In early 1972, mankind launched Pioneer 10, the first mission to the outer planets, the first to venture out beyond the orbit of Mars, out through the Jupiter system, and eventually, out of our solar system completely. The planets of our solar system come in two varieties. The inner four, including Earth, are heavy, rocky cinders. Where the fifth should be, there's only a band of debris, the asteroid belt. Beyond ride the enormous outer four, the mysterious gas giants. Astronomers have studied them since the time of Galileo. It was he who discovered Jupiter's four large moons with his newly perfected telescope. Beautiful ring Saturn third of the gas giants, Uranus. Rotating on its side, it circles the sun like a fallen gyroscope. And finally, Neptune. One of Neptune's moons, and one moon belonging to Uranus, were discovered by this modern Galileo, the late Dr. Gerard Kuiper of the University of Arizona. His backyard in Tucson has flowers, a swimming pool, and a private observatory. Here at Catalina Peak, 
His studies have produced some of the most outstanding color photographs ever made of Jupiter from the Earth's surface. This is sort of a typical uh, photograph which uh, shows the red spot of the planet, which is the most prominent feature. This black uh, spot here is the satellite shadow, is the satellite EO, which is the nearest of the four large satellites of the planet. The uh, uh, satellite itself is here and doesn't show very well contrasted to the uh, planet itself. Now the first thing you see is first of course that the disk of the planet is elliptical, that is because of its rapid rotation, which is roughly 10 hours, the period is roughly 10 hours. The diameter of this planet is about 10 times the diameter of the Earth, so it is a gigantic planet. The total mass is not, however, a thousand times, the volume is a thousand times, but the mass is only about 300 times that of the Earth. So the mean density of this planet is somewhat like the Sun, and that is because it is largely composed of hydrogen, so the composition of this planet is very, very different from the Earth, and very similar, in fact, to the Sun, except the temperature, of course, is much lower than the Sun. And because the temperature is low, you get a chemistry here, which is totally different from the Sun. So you have all these interesting colors here, and what we have been doing in recent years is to try to understand both the motions of all these clouds and their composition. Our odyssey to the outer planets begins here at Cape Kennedy. A good omen under a mock Jupiter sunrise, the ungainly pregnant guppy delivers a special cargo. The Jupiter Pioneers were built by TRW Systems of Redondo Beach, California, under contract to NASA's Ames Research Center. The project involved some 25 million man-hours of meticulous work by the government, industry, university, pioneer team. Each marvelously compact and reliable spacecraft weighs less than 600 pounds, including some 65 pounds of scientific instruments. The 11 onboard sensors include five radiation and charged particle detectors, one magnetometer, and three light measuring devices. One for the visible spectrum, and one for either end of the visible range, the infrared and the ultraviolet. There's also an experiment to look for asteroids, and one to measure the number of times Pioneer is struck by space dust. All of these devices together use less electricity than one 25-watt bulb. That's energy conservation. Two other investigations dig out new information about the Jupiter system from ground tracking data. The question arises, what can 65 pounds of space-borne instruments tell us that Earth's finest facilities can't? For example, the famous Mount Palomar telescope with its 17-foot diameter glass eye. A scientist who uses both Pioneer and Palomar is Dr. Guido Munch of Caltech. We have used the 200-inch telescope extensively for planetary observations. This is the largest operating telescope that has ever been built. With this telescope, the planet Jupiter appears of the size of a 50-cent piece. The Pioneer infrared experiment will provide a map of the heat emitted by the planet with a three-inch telescope. But at the distance of closest approach, the planet will cover one-fifth of the sky. And this is the advantage that we get from the three-inch telescope to the ground base with the large telescope here. The need to measure the quantity of heat accurately is that all the meteorology, all the motion of the clouds that we see in Jupiter is governed by the amount of heat coming from the inside. And we hope that a real understanding of the meteorology of Jupiter will in fact provide us with a better way to handle our weather problems.
The second day of March, 1972, Pioneer 10 waits for launch atop a new three-stage version of the Atlas Centaur rocket. later, a sister spacecraft, Pioneer 11, left the pad on its long and chancy voyage to Jupiter and Saturn. It's not easy to break out of the solar system. It requires enough speed to defeat the sun's gravity as well as Earth's gravity. Pioneer streaks away faster than any previous spacecraft, gulping distance at a million miles a day passing the moon in just 11 hours. Still, Jupiter is nearly two years away. On the way out past Mars, the experiments are tested and calibrated. Their data add to mankind's understanding of the interplanetary climate of space. The asteroid belt, as some had imagined it, before Pioneer 10, it was pictured as a region where great boulders grind together, creating a 40,000 mile per hour sandstorm. If so, it might have represented a perpetual barrier to outer planet flights. In fact, the pioneers found very little space dust in the asteroid belt. True, there are several thousand asteroids, some as big as Texas, but they should offer no menace to navigation. Pioneer gets its electricity from small onboard atomic heat sources. At a half billion miles, the sun is too weak to power solar cells. The spacecraft spins five times a minute for stabilization. On ground command, small thrusters fire to maintain the spin rate and to keep the large dish antenna precisely pointed at the receding Earth. This radio link is a two-way street. A constant stream of information flows back about the health of the Pioneer and its scientific observations. Pioneer is managed and controlled from Ames Research Center located at Mountain View, California, near San Francisco. The nerve center is in this building. Pioneer project manager, Charles F. Hall. So we're in the mission control area for Pioneer 10, and behind us is the mission control room. Now, right now, they're preparing to send uh, quite a few commands up to the spacecraft merely to uh, change the attitude of the, one of the instruments, the operating mode, so that we can uh, look on Jupiter. The interesting feature here is that the uh, round-trip light time, the time to get a message from here up to the spacecraft, and then to get a return answer is an hour and a half. So our people in there have to be used to this uh, uh, hour and a half delay when they start planning the mission. Commander Orkin. Orkin. Uh, we just received the staff clear message. Roger. Orkin command, I'll verify command stack loaded. Block message number nine. First command, IP whiskey two, time one four one zero three two decimal eight. Roger, copy. We're enabling message stand at this time. The pioneers are run by men who send commands from Earth, not by automatic systems on board. This cuts complexity and costs. During encounter, it's busy here. For example, to command just the electronic camera that makes pictures of Jupiter, Pioneer Control transmits some 15,000 commands in just two months. In response to these commands, the camera scans Jupiter's turbulent cloud tops as Pioneer spins toward encounter. Because the spacecraft is moving at up to 80,000 miles per hour, and because Jupiter is rotating at 22,000 miles per hour, the scans do not immediately form a pretty picture. They must be decoded and corrected for distortion. First, the scans are built up line by line on a television display. This gives a quick look at the operation of the system and a tantalizing hint to the spectacular pictures buried in the raw data. After the first stage of prettying up, 
Jupiter's first close-up portrait emerges. Late November, 1973, 20 months after launch. Pioneer 10 closes in on Jupiter. Each hour brings the planet 20,000 miles closer. What lies below those inscrutable cloud tops? Could there be life in this maelstrom where pressures may reach 200,000 times Earth's? There are scientists who think that the answer might be yes, that deep in this raging atmosphere of ammonia, marsh gas, and helium, the self-replicating spark may have been struck. One believer is Dr. Carl Sagan of Cornell University. Jupiter has an atmosphere rich in hydrogen and its compounds, the same kind of atmosphere that the Earth had at the time of the origin of life. So we think that the building blocks of life, uh, at least earthly life, are being produced on Jupiter today, raining down from the skies like, like manna from heaven. And Jupiter may be a vast planetary laboratory in the chemistry of the origin of life that's been working for about five billion years. It's by no means out of the question that there are forms of life in the clouds of Jupiter. And uh, indeed, if you viewed the solar system from afar, I think you could make an argument that life on Jupiter was more likely than life anywhere else, including on the Earth. Dr. Sagan also provided for Pioneer the famous picture postcard to extraterrestrial life. But in the remote contingency that there are interstellar spacefaring societies, which might someday pick up this derelict, no longer radioing, we thought we would put a message on it to indicate a little bit of where we are, when we are, and who we are. We think that the, the information on where we are and when we are, indicated in this part of the message by the configuration of certain cosmic objects called pulsars, will be completely obvious to uh, any society capable of traveling between the stars. These two objects will be more mysterious because it is unlikely that there will be human beings anywhere else, even though there may be other creatures elsewhere. And the plaque has served a very useful purpose in making us think about what sort of impression we might wish to give to the cosmos. Each morning, the key scientific investigators and the key spacecraft personnel meet in the office of Pioneer Project Manager Charlie Hall for a stand-up meeting. Why not a sit-down meeting? Because, says Charlie, people don't talk so long when their feet get tired. So like a contrast, I can see a bit over I have the impression that it is all in the face. I don't know for sure that okay. it is all in the face. Yeah, yeah. With such accuracy, but just grossly, whether we can yeah. trust the angles on yeah, the CD. I'm to say anything because I don't know. We'll have to get to it. Say 250 degrees or something like that, system three, which is not far from what the radio astronomers preferred. We have three sets of accurate observations with the IPP this week since the last precession maneuver. Uh, what we're seeing here is that in both for both electrons and protons, we're seeing in first approximation an in phase change. But don't you know oh, you're not it's going up pretty, pretty good. No, it's all right. It's going up pretty good. Yep. December 2nd, 1973. Tomorrow, Pioneer will make its closest pass of Jupiter when this fantastic world will fill one fifth of the sky. Today, Pioneer is being cooked by incredibly severe radiation, yet everything continues to work perfectly. This spectacular picture shows the shadow of the satellite Io, just as Dr. Kuiper's ground-based photo did. But from this distance, new details in the cloud bands become evident. Huge coiling storm areas larger than the Earth. Since launch, Pioneer has been slowing down. Now the pull of Jupiter's gravity speeds it up to a fantastic 82,000 miles per hour. In effect, this crack the whip left turn gives Pioneer another rocket stage to fling it out of the solar system. Unexpectedly, the space dust count soars a hundred times as many hits. Jupiter's gravity may act as a cosmic vacuum cleaner. December 3rd, Pioneer sweeps to within 81,000 miles of the cloud tops. Now things happen fast. 15 minutes after closest approach, the spacecraft is targeted to pass out of Earth's sight behind the orange moon Io for a critical two minutes. This ultra-precise maneuver 
will use radio effects to reveal new information about Io, if the signal can be picked up again on the other side, and if Pioneer will obey commands again. Back at Mission Control, there's a maternity hospital atmosphere. They won't know what happened in space until 45 minutes later. The speed of light is much too slow for the anxious parents. We missed the EO occupation by one second, and I was just sort of kidding him or telling him that you, you have to go through the ecliptic at the right time. When the EO goes in front of you, we're three Jupiter radii away, EO six Jupiter radii, you gotta get all this thing lined up, and we missed it by a second. <laughs> Next time we'll do better. An hour later, Pioneer passes out of sight of both Earth and Sun, this time behind Jupiter. The spacecraft is collecting its worst radiation exposure now. Tension is even greater this time. And so is the relief. Now Pioneer views a sight never before seen by man, the crescent Jupiter. From Earth, we can see only its full phase, like a full moon. These lighting angles give scientists new information. On the television system, the images rapidly become smaller. Now several consecutive pictures can be stored on the tube at once. Thanks to energy literally stolen from Jupiter, Pioneer 10 departs more than twice as fast as it arrived. Early this morning, uh, we, uh, now the world wants to know, what have we learned? The scientists readily admit to newsmen that for each question answered, a hundred new ones have been raised. Project scientist Dr. John Wolfe reports. Approximately 44 Jovian radii. We uh, had the indication of a very strange plasma distribution. We're taking back with us to our laboratories uh, uh, data which essentially uh, are puzzling to us and will take a long time to work out. Some points are clear. The whole Jupiter system is heavier than we thought by about the weight of two Earth moons. Io has a thin atmosphere, thus Jupiter's four large moons probably all have atmospheres. Seeing uh, uh, relatively abrupt decreases in the field magnitude to much lower values a compass on Jupiter would point to the South Pole instead of the North Pole. The infrared experiment successfully mapped Jupiter's heat in fine detail. The planet gives off more than twice as much heat as it receives from the Sun. Why? Possibly its enormous gravity makes it contract like a slow motion star. The white belts are cooler and therefore higher bands of clouds stretched around basically darker colored material below. Also the night side and the day side appear the same temperature. Discoveries like these flash out to the world. To experimenters, some of the most interesting findings concern Jupiter's radiation belts and magnetic field. Pioneer first broke into the magnetic field an incredible four million miles in front of the planet. Because of the pressure of the solar wind, this field streams out much farther behind Jupiter. Closer in, Pioneer indicates that Jupiter's intense radiation belts wobble up and down around a magnetic center some 10,000 miles from the center of the planet. In brief, Jupiter is much different from Earth and much more complex than researchers imagined. However, Pioneer proved that a spacecraft could survive the radiation. After encounter, 
the data tapes for the imaging experiment go to the University of Arizona for computer enhancement. In a meticulous process, millions of data points are juggled up and down the scale. And what emerges is a portrait of Jupiter to challenge the most imaginative artist. The pioneers, first to brave this land of giants, first to fly forever among the lonely and endless stars of our galaxy, carry mankind's message. We're on our way. Theory holds that Jupiter is so big and so far from the sun that the huge planet retains most of the material from which it was formed about four and one half billion years ago. Scientists think that beneath the clouds, Jupiter is an ocean of mostly liquid hydrogen. Theory says that above the ocean is a 600 mile high, mostly hydrogen atmosphere. Jovian clouds also contain water, ammonia, and methane. Between very cold cloud tops and the very hot interior are probably regions of Earth normal temperatures. Jupiter's lightning could be a catalyst in the formation of organic compounds in these regions. During our next program, Jupiter, a clearer picture, we will see how NASA plans to send the Galileo mission to Jupiter in 1986. Galileo, launched from a shuttle by the Lewis Managed Centaur, will orbit the planet and send a probe into the clouds. We will also see the very sharp pictures which Voyager showed us of Jupiter and its moons. This is Larry Ross saying goodbye from NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio.